For those of you unfamiliar with Manufacturing Works, uh, we work to keep manufacturing companies uh, around. We responsibly help with individual companies like providing Cleveland Police Department uh, incident maps, offering summer work camp to young teenagers excited about manufacturing careers and identifying potential relocation sites for businesses. We also offer a program like today's webinar to proactively help manufacturers thrive. Like many nonprofits, companies join Manufacturing Works to support our mission, and one of those is our member, E2B Technologies. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Frank Niesenbaum. Frank is the VP of ERP Sales for E2B Technologies. He has been recommending, selling, and implementing ERP software for over 20 years in Northeast Ohio. His primary focus has been helping manufacturers and distributors bring automation to their organizations. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Frank to discuss today's topic, improving inventory optimization. Great. Thanks, Ron. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, again, good morning, everyone. And I uh, appreciate everybody taking time out of their busy schedule to join us today. Um, I look forward to providing some valuable information and recommendations around inventory optimization. Um, as a manufacturer and or distributor, if you are, your inventory is one of the most important, important assets you have and how you manage it can affect your success today and in the future and definitely affect your bottom line. So as Ron said, my name is Frank Wiesenbaum and I am the VP of sales for ERP, ERP sales for ETB technologies. I'll talk about us a little bit more in a moment. Um, briefly as an agenda, uh, across the next 30 to 40 minutes, we're gonna take some time. Um, obviously we've introduced ourselves. <clears throat> I will tell you a little bit about our organization in a moment. Um, we're gonna discuss what inventory optimization is a little bit about why I believe it's important to you and your organization, what happens when it doesn't exist or you don't have procedures or policies in place around inventory optimization, um, stockouts and stock overages, which we all experience. Um, talk about some myths that are, are out there about um, inventory optimization. Um, as well as then provide you with, from our experience, some best practices around how you can leverage this inside your organization. One and only picture of me, I'm going to go really fast because I'm sad that you have to look at me, but not bad for an old guy. So who is E2B Technologies? Um, we're an organization based in Chardon, Ohio. We have a very passionate and experienced team um, with a lot of experience. Uh, experience in this industry and, and this in technology around high quality, uncomplicated, and we believe innovative ERP solutions, um, as well as other business applications that are all built on current and modern and future technologies. Frankly, today we're looking at the future technologies uh, platforms, and we offer turnkey consulting around everything we do. And it's important to point out that we also have a very strong development team that are our resources doing custom development in, around, and for the products we sell, but also custom um, and extensive uh, integration work as well. So let's get started. <clears throat> the first and probably most important thing is to get a definition of what at least our concept is of what inventory optimization is. So in a simple sense, we'd like to say that inventory optimization is what you get when you strike the perfect balance between having enough inventory to satisfy, satisfy your customer service standards and demand of your customers while stocking as little inventory as possible. But inventory optimization gets really complicated when supply and demand are constantly in a state of flux across a sizable number of SKUs or items. And as well, it may also be multiple locations in, in far reaching geography. So everything not in one place. So the larger the complexity, the bigger the challenge. 
And I think that's a, a pretty solid definition of what we're talking about when we talk about how to optimize that inventory, that size of an inventory across that many different locations possibly. <clears throat> talking about why it's important. I mean, obviously maximizing profitability is important to everyone. And I think the quote that says, as your SKU numbers increase, your inventory challenges increase is pretty accurate. So let's talk about the answer. It's based on the ultimate goal of every business, we believe, and that's maximize profitability. For most businesses, inventory is often the single largest item on their balance sheet. Yes, you might have fixed assets in large numbers. You might have um, uh, accounts receivable, cash. There may be a lot of things that are, might be bigger numbers, but in terms of the value of the asset itself, inventory for most manufacturers that are tracking raw materials, work in process, finished goods, all those pieces, um, it's probably the most important asset you have and it also probably eats up the most working capital or dollars, um, whereby even the smallest percentage improvement can translate into significant savings. Even more importantly, and more true, <clears throat> if you're buying, stocking, and using things like precious metals, uh, might be commodities, things that have highly volatile pricing and changes in the market, or you might be engaged in using perishable items, uh, materials that have expiration dates, or short shelf life, or long lead times, things like that. Those all, all have a, an effect on the bottom line and the dollars we're spending. Informed businesses recognize that they will not maximize profitability if they do not meet their customer demands due to important things like stocking, key items stocking out or other items gather dust or expire or perish. Because their inventory uses so much of their working capital and impacts revenue and profitability are a big part of what we're trying to talk about. <clears throat> Excuse me. What happens when we don't leverage, use, or have any processes or procedures in place for inventory optimization? I think it's a great question. Not having enough inventory can result in stockouts. Obviously, nobody wants to have stockouts. Or unplanned shortages. I like that terminology. They're unplanned. We don't know they're coming, but they often occur. The inability of us to fulfill incoming orders leads to sales loss to your competitors, or even worse, extra costs for expedited delivery. Oh, we've got to get that item for this guy or this person uh, by tomorrow, so we've got to spend the extra, extra cost to get it shipped in, the extra freight costs. Or worst case, maybe we have to have it drop shipped, which now results in extra freight costs and other things that we didn't plan for, but we sure as heck want to make sure that our customers know what's, you know, they get the stuff that they ordered so again, stockouts are horrible. Having too much inventory is also not the answer. So what that does is it results in the misallocation of our working capital, and I'll translate that into dollars, dollars straight out of the bottom line. If you think about the inventory costs that are associated with carrying an inventory, such as warehousing, insurance, depreciation, taxes, other costs, extra freight, or what we might lose to spoilage or shrinkage because inventory is sitting around and we don't know we have it. It's not being leveraged in, in anything we sell or at all in our manufacturing process. All of that leads to waste of money. We've had, in, in our experience, working with organizations around some of these, these items in terms of inventory optimization, seeing cost, seeing this cost organizations uh, at least 25% and sometimes as much as 50%. <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the reasons that stockouts would kind of define the whole process around inventory optimization, what it is and that type of thing. What, what causes stockouts and, and overages to occur? There are a lot of different uh, items that lead to this. Number one, and, and we'll talk about this a lot this morning, are misaligned priorities. For example, the sales team knows that it's easier to sell when there's enough inventory available. But let's face it, salespeople want to sell. 
So, you know, sales are made, maybe that stock isn't checked as often, not sure that it's there. So as much work as we can do up front to make sure that the stock levels are where they need to be so that we can meet the demand of our sales team, that's, that's crucial. And so that's what they're concerned about. The purchasing department, they want to negotiate better terms by purchasing larger volumes. Uh, definitely freight costs are involved in that. They want to work with the vendors to maximize and minimize the cost and maximize the purchasing that's being done. So that's their priority. The production team, we all know that they want to run, possibly want to run larger batches or streamline the process to make sure that we get things done on time and minimize downtime. So again, all of these pieces of the organization or departments in the organization are affecting what's going on in inventory. And ultimately, there's an executive team that has something to do with it, as well as the finance team, which is watching the dollars and the, the money that we spend to be profitable. Some people in the organization want to minimize inventory levels. So they maybe want to look at just-in-time inventory, making sure we only stock what we need when we need it, not before, and not too late, and not too early. So I, I will pressure, I will I will push the, the knowledge that there needs to be a consensus inside your organization for what stock levels make the most sense for the entire organization. And there needs to, and this needs to be based, and this is the most important we're going to talk about a little more as we start to dig into this. It needs to be based on factual data and real-time data, not a snapshot, not a point in time, but real-time flowing data that drives the decisions that these people are making for the organization as a whole. Lack of visibility and fluctuating patterns. I love the, the, the words. So many companies struggle to identify their supply and demand patterns of, of their consumers and their suppliers throughout the organization. The unpredictability of supply and demand is, is, is present for everyone. And it's a challenge as every business struggles to uncover these patterns. We all know they exist, but what are they? It's important to realize that there are patterns, first of all. While we may think we know exactly who we sell to, when we sell, and why we sell, <clears throat> there are patterns there, and an organization has to work to uncover them. So some of the ways to identify these supply patterns, we are the, these, excuse me, the supply patterns is to work closely with your vendors. Your vendors want to sell to you and obviously they want to sell a lot and they want to sell it often. But we need to match their replenishment policies and how they ship to us and sell to us to our demand. Okay, we need to leverage factors like shelf life, lead time, shipping costs, and other things that affect how and when we're going to get our inventory, what that costs to our bottom line. Demand patterns are more difficult to predict as competition is always changing and some of the SKUs sell, might sell seasonally, for example. We might sell certain things in the winter, certain things in the spring, certain in the summer. They may be seasonally tied to holidays or other events that we have to account for in how our inventory needs to be managed. There are big ticket items. Maybe you're a producer or manufacturer of big ticket items. You make boats, vehicles large pieces of machinery or equipment. These typically sell one at a time, have, have a uh, longer engineering cycle, a longer, um, a, a longer development cycle, manufacturing cycle that takes more time for the process so the items in the inventory are moving through at a slower pace and the whole process takes longer to produce. This all should and will affect how we manage our inventory and what we keep in terms of, of, of optimization. And of course, the manufacturing cycles themselves, including things like downtime, resource constraints, machine operation, all the things that go on in our manufacturing process also are going to affect what we do when it comes to the patterns of how things occur inside of our organization. Third one, time-consuming forecasting tools. I love the word forecasting because everybody's a, a visionary and can forecast. Um, and, and the quote again here is, there are new affordable inventory optimization solutions that are definitely changing the landscape that we're all playing around and in, 
Um, so the playing field is different for all businesses, and there's a lot of lot of advancements in this area. So SKU by SKU or item by item forecasting has traditionally taken a lot of man hours. We all know that, man or woman. We spend a lot of time getting data, um, and it's a manual process of, first of all, exporting out of the supply chain that data, as well as the sales history data and information that we manually create for forecasts from an ERP system or manual paperwork or other spreadsheets. And we take all that data and we put it into a spreadsheet for analysis. These manual processes, I know in your organization or ours or anyone's, are going to be time insensitive, or time intensive and absolutely prone, prone to error because of the manual work. So all of the inventory managers on this, this presentation, on this call or, or out in industry, are all facing the same challenge of trying to predict demand for thousands, or for some of you, probably hundreds of thousands of SKUs that are scattered across multiple locations, not necessarily in one location. It could be, again, spread out geographies, as well as multiple manufacturing plants that are also not all in one place and all storing, using, and, and transacting with the material we need. So manual demand forecasting doesn't keep up with the trends or and or is riddled with mistakes or frankly, most often doesn't even happen at all because it takes too much time and it's nobody's job to technically analyze or optimize what we're doing in our warehouse or in our manufacturing plants. Number four, unnecessary manual processes. Yeah, I've talked about manual transactions and manual processes a lot, <clears throat> but it's probably one of the, the most important that goes on here. So purchasers, they may argue that they can't do proper analysis because the time to cover the, the time to cover a lot of forecasting ground is limited. What's worse is it takes so long not only to, to work with the data, but first of all, find it. Where is the data? How many different places it's stored in? How many places do we have to pull data from? Then we have to export it to spreadsheets. Or you might have other in-house solutions. Again, not connected all together, but other solutions. And a plenty, plenty of extremely useful data goes unanalyzed. That, that's the key. So a lot of this data is not even coming into our calculations of what's going on in the warehouse. The executive management team, they may see inventory optimization as a worthy goal, but they think of it as out of reach. Analyzing inventory performance is seen as an overwhelming manual data export task, and it requires way too much time. And that's even before we start to manipulate and transform the data into something we can analyze and actually use. If such an analysis can be done at all, it can only be done one, every once in a while, and that only provides an isolated snapshot of an ever-changing target. I like to focus on that just because, again, these are fixed points in time where most of the manual systems or the things you may be doing, excuse me, or have been doing in the past are at a fixed point in time. It's not flowing. It's not real. So purchasers and planners, we know you all have the experience and the intrinsic knowledge of what goes on in the business. You've been there. You live it every day but you don't have enough time to give this the work that it needs to be accurate. And in my world, manual equals mistakes. And the worst part is the poor timing or the not being relevant at the right time for any organization. That's what manual does for us. <clears throat> so we'll transition a little bit and talk about some of the myths about inventory uh, optimization. <clears throat> I like the, the, the comment that integrating an inventory optimization tool into my ERP system is a long and costly project. Plus, I'll have resistance because of the effort involved. Besides, we stock new SKUs and new items. We engineer and create new items all the time, and it won't help with those. I like that. Reality, though, with the right tool, the cost is very affordable, and your ramp up can be really fast, and the ROI can be substantial. Think about what an informed executive does. An inf informed executive or manager knows better. Modern systems are fast, affordable, easy to use, 
and the implementation is easier and faster, and it means your ROI, ROI starts quickly. As far as that goes, information, informed executives make, or informed executives know better. I like to say it the way, you know better. You know that you're not doing the right things that you've got to make changes. As we talked about in the beginning, because inventory represents such a huge investment for your organization and many others, the reduced outlays of working capital, translated into dollars, for stock outages, stock overages, and carrying, carrying costs can be substantial. Informed businesses understand the importance of implementing a tool to help better optimize their inventory. Most companies already do or try to do these things to optimize their inventory. Unfortunately, this is typically in disparate systems, manual reporting, or manual systems that have to be human tri triggered and done just to have things occur, even to get data to be analyzed. So if you leverage and automate and use the tools that are out there, you'll sell, sell do save dollars and you'll create a very rapid ROI. That's a given. <clears throat> so we've talked about what inventory optimization is, at least our definition why we think it's important to you and your organization, the problems that you're going to encounter and what you have or, or do have with inventory optimization. So now let's talk a little bit about some of the best practices we've experienced and that we can recommend um, that can help you with your internal inventory optimization. They're going to, they're going to align and, and kind of follow some of the things we talked about back when we talked at the beginning about the problems and things that go on with inventory optimization. And the first one is alignment and accountability. <clears throat> Frankly, I mean, if you, you want to joke about it, we can all joke if you're a, a Northeast Ohio people, alignment and accountability is what the Cleveland Browns have been all about, right? That's what this whole process we all just went through with a new GM and a coach and, and everybody that's involved. It was all about alignment and accountability, not different people pulling and doing things in different ways all one way. We'll see if it works for them, but I know it'll work for you. So though they share the same goal of maximizing profitability, there are forces within and outside your company that oppose one another when it comes to your supply chain and your manufacturing shop floors. If informed executives hope to make inventory optimization go from policy to best practices, you have to start by align, aligning these opposing forces around one set of priorities. It starts at the top. So the executive management team knows that the bottom line is what they're all about, or at least a big part of what they're about, what they're trying to, to, to make sure that they're doing to maximize profit or shareholder returns or things like that. But it then trickles down to the department head. So if the executive team says, okay, this is what we need to do, now let's find a way to do this together, and we bring in the department heads. So bring them together, formulate a plan, something that works for everyone that is in the organization, but most importantly achieves the goal of maximizing profitability and growth, but they have to feel a part of it. So whether it's finance, purchasing, manufacturing, the warehouse folks, uh, the sales team, everybody's got a stake in this, and you can't do it in a vacuum. It has to be something that everyone buys into and knows what their part of the data production is, and then they can see the results that come back to them from what we do when we put the right systems in place. So database policies and integrity through ERP. There's a, a few bullet points here, and I apologize for the view, um, but there's a few things here that I wanted to touch on, and I'm gonna give an example of a, of a client of ours and what we did with someone internally. Um, obviously, replacing manual processes anywhere that you can with automation. I'm not saying, suggesting that everything has to be automized, uh, automized, automated, but there are a lot of places I know within your organization that you can spend the time and the money to automate that will make you more effective. Utilizing your ERP system, not telling you which one or what you should be doing, but usually using an ERP system to gather and store the data to drive your policies. <clears throat> this is important. Why gather the data or store it or try to put it together manually 
or in multiple systems. The right and strong ERP system will do the work for you just by you functioning every day in your normal processes of the business. Tracking SKUs, obviously that's simple in, in an ERP system. RFID systems or radio frequency ID identification systems. That's what I'm gonna use in my example, but another technology that helps track, move and store inventory within your system. And what it does is provide real-time transaction recording. <clears throat> so whether it's as simple as barcoding and scanning in the warehouse or on the shop floor, everything we do in that regard will save time provide real-time data to everything inside the system from an inventory perspective, but also eliminate errors um, and give even more data that you wouldn't capture if you weren't doing it real-time. And I'll talk about RFID in a second. Analyzing sales, purchasing, supply chain, manufacturing, all the pieces that go on, what these systems let us do today is forecast data anywhere, anytime, because a lot of it's in the cloud. And even if it's on-premise and you're not a cloud proponent, you still have the data available because you're leveraging the systems that let you do it. So I wanted to talk about real briefly, just for a second, one of our clients that's a multifaceted manufacturer and they're in a very volatile industry all around composites. So what they were facing with the rising volume, fast paced changing markets, they began to struggle with managing their field warehouses as, as well as their inventory uh, in their main warehouse. Their current processes weren't meeting the demands of their quickly changing market, again, with a, a highly volatile composite material. So what were the limitations they were facing? They were facing several in their inventory management process. This included the receiving process, tracking products as they entered the system, and then ultimately the integrity of the stock status or what they thought they had, where they had it, and why they had it. So their personnel was manually entering information into the ERP, which then led to difficulty tracking items because they were missing material. Each item needed to be individually identified, validated, and then counted by some personnel against the incoming paperwork they had. Again, forms that said that, that they had to record the transaction. So it required not only equipment, but personnel to offload the incoming trucks. And then this process led to problems such as missing or incorrect paperwork, lack of space to offload items causing a timing issue. What was the solution? So we came up with a solution where with their limitations and what they were experiencing, we needed to find a way to improve their processes so they could better serve their customers. The three objectives we addressed were the automation of the receiving process to eliminate human error, tracking all items throughout the supply chain, even when they were on the road in trucks going from the United States, let's say to Mexico, and having the ability to cycle count them accurately and timely. So optimizing their ERP, which that was a base piece, in conjunction with what we added was an RFID system, radio frequency identification tags to all the items that could be read remotely, again, wirelessly through the, through the air, offered a solution that would address these, the limitations they were facing. So using both of these systems not only gives them a competitive benefit, but also is a significant cost reduction in product management. We were able to take items and track them from the moment they were on, their, on the road to us. As soon as they got to the dock with the tags, we were able to identify where they are, where they're going to be put away, when they were received, the timing, and even to the point where while they were on the trucks in motion from one place to another, we were able to actually track temperature inside of the truck so that if it varied, we'd know that a notice was sent to the driver, <coughs> excuse me, to say, hey, temperature's dropping, stop. You could check it out and make sure there's a problem. Because losing this material or having something happen to it in route when it was moving from place to place was, place was, extremely, it was extremely costly. So all of this put together, we were able to do it and provide that the purchase order numbers that they were receiving against, the current stock based on production, back flushing, real-time production, receivers and shipments, all through the tagging and identification of these systems, gave them two systems where the point of receipt was the dock and cycle counting was facilitated all through automation. So using this, and their current structure with RFID technology, we gave them the ability, ability to automate their receiving process, 
track items throughout the system from supply chain through manufacturing and transportation, and it was all done accurately. So again, it's a very high level example of what can be done and very specific to a specific client. But I guess the point of telling the story is so that <clears throat> you will have an understanding that there are ways that we can automate processes and not as extensive as RFIDs necessarily, but just barcoding, scanning, or just having systems in place will provide the data you need to manage your inventory, but most importantly, be able to cost it and not lose money because inventory is sitting idle or being wasted or being lost throughout the process. So let's take a, a final look um, at what inventory optimization is or what it can be. Of course, absolutely perfect inventory optimization isn't possible. We all know that, nothing's perfect. But in the unpredictable, unpredictable universe called the marketplace, stockouts and stock overages are going to happen. But on the other hand, inventory, inventory managers at best in class companies have proven time and time again that they can be substantially reduced if systems are put in place and everybody's on the same team working towards the same goal. So on the screen now, and this is just an example from one solution that's out there, not specific to anybody or, or not that recommended over any or any other, but this is an example of a dashboard or business intelligence that will give you the opportunity to see what's possible. Okay, just one example. So what does it show us? It's an example of a dashboard that's fed by actual day-to-day -day activity. So the people in the organization are doing purchasing, receiving, shipping, manufacturing, shop floor, um, finance is, is doing what they do every day. We're pick, pack, and shipping. All these things are going on in what people do every day. But based on that day-to-day -day activity, okay, in accounting, purchasing, warehousing, and of course, manufacturing, all that data is feeding this automatically generated dashboard. But additionally, in most systems that are out there, this is modifiable, customizable, and self-created or with a partner to create the dashboards amongst the different departments that feed them the data that they need to run their, ba their business and do what needs to be done on a daily basis. So look at it. What's it doing? <clears throat> in the background, it's reviewing millions it could be millions of software, uh, of, of SKUs, it could be thousands, it could be hundreds of thousands or millions across whatever number of locations you might have or manufacturing plants. All that data being pulled into one source, giving you the ability to forecast fast and accurately. So it's looking at stock levels, it's looking at forecast, it's looking at backlog, it's looking at production, looking at all those things to help you forecast and accurately plan for the future. It also can recommend replenishment based on your policy. So you've established the policies, let's say at the minimum level of minimums, maximums, lot sizes, EOQ, lead times, all the other things that you need that are just planning criteria. Now take all of that data and pull all that together with actual activity throughout the system providing you with ways to, to, to suggest replenishment based on real-time live data that's, that's optimizing your inventory levels. Ultimately, it will detect problems. Where are stockouts? Where are potential stockouts? You see all kinds of different things on the dashboard that you see. So it gives you a lot of flexibility around getting data that will help you detect potential problems. Everything we're doing is trying to get to be proactive not reactive, not a point in time, a continuous, a continuum of time as we move through any year or any organization. KPIs, we all know what key performance indicators are. We know what they are in finance, but in inventory, things like inventory turns, uh, cost to carry, things like that. Those are important. And again, we're already doing the work. We're filling orders, we're making products, we're moving, we're shipping, we're doing all that. All that is is data. And again, rather than manual systems where we have to go and pull all that data together into spreadsheets and trying to create this, I wish you luck, where the systems themselves are already built to provide this data to you at a push of a button or just automatically on a screen. And lastly, one of the other things that I think is important 
is giving people the ability to monitor vendor performance. <clears throat> so how are they doing? Are they matching the lead times or delivery schedules or, or commitment to getting products to us? Are they shipping the right quantities, under shipping, over shipping? Um, is it, are, are there uh, bad items? Are we returning a lot? Is their quality good? All of that again is being fed by what we do every day and feeding that information to us that then gets summarized in these types of dashboards. So at this point, we're gonna put up a poll question briefly just to get a sense of what some of you may be doing now. And if you could vote for us or click for us and let us know what it is that you're doing, it would be helpful. So we're just gonna give you a, man a minute. Inventory management approach. I'm just curious how many of you are currently using some graphical dashboards to manage your inventory? Pretty simple. Yes, you are. No, you're, you're using spreadsheets or you're not doing anything. We're going to give you a minute just to kind of give us some answers and look at the results. This is not a test. We're not going to grade you. We're just trying to get a pulse. We might also want to mention that it is anonymous. It is anonymous. That's true. We're not, we don't know who's saying what, and there's no judging going on. And again, I think in today's world, there's so much out there, um, and it's hard to analyze and hard to make decisions. We're just trying to get a sense of how many of you may be doing that. The results are now showing. Okay, great. Wow. Okay, I'm a little surprised, <laughs> um, but that's 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 both good, and it, it's kind of telling, right? So we just spent some time talking about, you know, what's out there and what we're doing. So I'm guessing that a lot of you are doing things manually or not at all. Um, it's not a bad thing or a good thing. I think what you'll find is that hopefully you'll see some of the information and what's out there that can be done that you'll take a look at it again. Again, whatever it may be, it may be a totally independent system, but it, it's interesting to me that, frankly, 100% of you um, are either doing it in spreadsheets or neither. It's good that the 33% is the lowest, the, the neither is the lowest, um, but I guess my takeaway from, the, from this is those using spreadsheets, good, you have something in place, you are doing something that's providing you with data, <clears throat> but I would tell you that as your organization continues to grow and change and, and get into other areas and move into other things, um, that there is room for some ways to make that even better and improve those processes and get information uh, a, a lot quicker. Anyway, thank you for participating. That was our only test question, so we're not going to push any more. So as we kind of bring this into... <clears throat> kind of bring to a close, um, you know, to me, what I would say to you is that, you know, as best in class companies, and, and again, over 20 plus years in, in our organization, spending time with manufacturers and distributors specifically, um, you know, there's some things here that we find that best in class companies will do. Um, and number one, I think this quote that says every stakeholder is focused and aligned around the goal of maximizing profitability, but even more so, cost containment through better inventory practices. I said it at the beginning, um, and I'll say it again now. I know that for most of you, inventory is a huge asset and is a lot of money, and in many cases, you may not even know what it's really costing you from loss of sales, production overruns or downtime, stockouts, all the things, I mean, inventory affects virtually everything that we do. So if we don't have that alignment and we're not looking for ways to control the cost, we're, we're hurting ourselves. So number one, customer loyalty. In an, uh, in an optimized inventory environment where we have the right stock levels at the right time, um, our customers are going to get what they need when they need it. That leads to customer loyalty. We don't want them searching somewhere else. We don't want to go somewhere else. 
and we don't want to spend the money to get the stuff earlier I mean, get the stuff at the last minute or ship to them directly. It makes no sense. It doesn't make them a better customer. It might make them happy at the moment, but still it's costing us a lot of money to do so, and that's not productive. In this environment, the sales team is actively involved in reviewing the forecast. So that results in improved alignment be between sales, purchasing, and finance. If those three teams are engaged together and are all sharing what they're doing to get to the ultimate goal of managing the right inventory at the right time, it also is going to help the production team. So the production shouldn't have to worry about the pieces that sales, purchasing, and finance are doing. They know that the data is right and the data is current, and they know that when they need material for production, they have it. If they're engineering something new, they're going to be able to get what they need when they need it to produce a new product. And sales and purchasing, all of the people are involved. Again, this goes back to the alignment and accountability. And again, I stress the word accountability because if everyone's aligned, everyone's involved and everyone's doing it together, we're all accountable to each other and ultimately the executive team. So the finance people, and I historically in my younger days wasn't was in the accounting world and the finance world, they have a robust perspective of what the projective inventory levels are and then the health of that investment. So, so rather than just looking at a balance sheet or numbers that come through, if they're engaged in this and you have the tools in place, they truly understand where inventory is, why it's at the levels it, are, it is, or they are, why we need more, or what we're going to do with it, when we're going to do with it. They're part of that, and they know that the investment that the ownership has put in their, in their hands is being spent the way it should be spent. Planners are able to monitor poor supplier performance, and they can negotiate improved delivery, provide vendors with projected orders, helping them to plan. So again, working with the vendors, we now have data. We know whether they're delivering on time, what they're delivering, is it good, is it bad, is the pricing right, it, can we match everything together? When we go back to them, we actually are having conversations that are about, hey, I need this much product by this date, or I, I gotta get this stuff. It's more about what the pricing is, how we can better prioritize and get larger shipments or more timely shipments with our vendors. I'm telling you, you'll have a lot more information to be able to do better with your vendors. Being able to identify inventory issues early. Okay, so we're gonna see, we saw on the dashboard, we'll see things where there might be bottlenecks or stockouts potential or whatever they may be. And in an automated environment, these optimized systems allow us to drill into the actual data, go all the way back to the source transaction or where it is and find out at least what's going on, where it's happening and why without leaving our desk or having to do a lot of manual work to get there. That's what inventory optimization systems do. We, we have a much better ability to allocate our investment, okay, and focus on what's important. Not about, again, the extra shipping costs or drop shipping or carrying costs or other things we're stuck on. It's better to allocate the investments inside the inventory or into manufacturing or some area of the company because we're not wasting money and spending it trying to get the inventory we need or having the right inventory at the right time. That's what optimization does. It helps improve scheduling. Uh, scheduling not only in, in the inventory world in terms of pick, pack, and ship and getting it out, but in the manufacturing process. If we're maintaining the right inventory and we don't have bottlenecks getting the data or the, the inventory in, the inventory out, keeping it at the right levels, our manufacturing is streamlined. They should be focused on getting product produced from cradle to grave through the manufacturing process back in inventory for shipment, not worrying about stockouts, not having the right material, not knowing where the inventory is. Again, we didn't we haven't spent a whole lot of time about warehouse automation, but that's another piece of inventory optimization is how we move, track, and pull, and, and do all the things we do in the warehouse, maybe in a more automated process with, uh, with wireless technology and things like that on tow motors and other ways to move around the warehouse. Again, ultimately, making the manufacturing process more efficient because the manufacturing team shouldn't have to worry about not having the right inventory at the right time or even the right products. And then lastly, 
you know, it, it's fun when we all say, well, safety stock, let's just add 10% or another 25 here or do whatever. It's better when we can do it and we're actually doing it against poor supply and unpredictable demand. If we can analyze that data and we actually are tracking it and, and producing it, we have the reporting that lets us create safety stock that makes sense. We know why we're going to need it at a, at a seasonal nature or we know where we have quality issues or we can identify all that up front. We know what products to keep safety stock on and again, minimizing the cost of just blanketly having safety stock for certain items across the board, especially high ticket, high dollar items, or as I talked about earlier, you know, commodities or um, precious metals or perishable items if you're in those types of industries. That is all really key to what we do. So with that, um, we are gonna spend, leave a little bit of time here, maybe even give you a little bit back in your day um, for any questions or, or anything you might have and do our best to answer. Up on the screen is my phone number and email um, and our web address. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to you, provide insight or anything I can do from my experience um, around this type of environment or you know, ERP or frankly anything. If there's something you wanna talk about, reach out to me. So I'm gonna kind of be quiet here and see if there are any questions. We did have one question come in earlier, um, and that was, uh, what is the best way to start the process of inventory optimization? Wow, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, you know, from, from our perspective, it's somebody taking it on as a project, right? Organizationally, to me, there's a planning meeting that takes place. Somebody identifying that, you know what? We don't have the systems in place. But here are the issues. You know, let's start with a planning meeting, getting the right people, not saying the whole company, but maybe some of the department heads that directly affect that in a short meeting with an agenda that says, okay, where are issues in inventory? Where are we having problems? Where are the bottlenecks? Where do we think they are? And what systems, identify what systems, manual, spreadsheets, uh, whatever they are, are already in place and sit down and spend that time to analyze why we believe inventory optimization, optimization is an issue for us, not for, for the outsiders, but that organization, I think that's a big thing. And then the, the second part of that will be trying to identify some dollar value that goes with that. What's it cost to the company, whether it's in lost sales or inventory, extra inventory costs, where it may be, there's a cost there. Um, you know, reaching out to someone like us is helpful, but frankly, before I even get there, it should be something that's done internally. Uh, we do have one more question that's been submitted and that is how can the manufacturing team directly contribute to inventory optimization? Another great question. Um, I, I guess, you know, looking at it as most of the people on here probably are manufacturers, right? And, and when we think inventory, we think, oh, it's distribution, oh, that's stocking, that's all the people in the warehouse. We, we don't really know about that. Untrue, right? Who, who in a manufacturing environment knows more about what inventory is needed, when it's needed, what the quality looks like, what the process is going to be to take it from that raw material we bought add time and, and labor and machining and whatever to it and make a finished good than the manufacturing folks. So I, I think when I talked about it before, um, this meeting absolutely needs to have someone from engineering, someone from operations involved, because on a daily basis, those are the people that are taking something or nothing and making it into something that we can sell. So their, their entire operation, their schedule, their, uh, their, their optimization is based on what inventory is available, making sure that it's available, that's of the highest quality, and it's at the right cost. So I, I would say that, you know, everything we've talked about today, frankly, most of it applies in some way to what the manufacturing group is doing. And, and it, it, in, it, in its systems, whether it's some um, third party or outside ERP or MRP or whatever the the, the phrase is you want to use to describe it, 
they're as equally important to what we're going to try to do or more important to the overall picture. Because again, that, that's what we do for a living is to make product. So uh, again, I think their involvement, they, they can't be quiet. They have to be part of the process because they are part of the result. So that's, that's what I would say to it. So again, if there, there aren't any other questions, we'll, we'll pause for a minute and see if there are. If there aren't, um, I really want to thank you all for attending. I, I know it can get kind of long, when we're not, but we're not trying to do demos. We're not trying to sell you something. We're just trying to give you knowledge. Um, and if you were able to garner something that helps in your business, we accomplished our goal. So I'm more than happy to continue the conversation if anybody has it and look forward to the next time we get together to talk about something else. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us today.